And thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. Um, I know that there are nicer things to do on a sunny Sunday, in the last few sunny days here in Seattle. But it's really important for us because this is where we start to build um, the community that our program is all about. And um, as you'll begin to find out, if you already haven't, that in addition to the amazing learning experience you're all going to have while you're in this program, the other 50% value is a net worth that you're going to join and that you're going to create and the community that you're going to be part of. So this is step one in doing that. Step two will be in the class that you'll join me and Brent Friedman in, in a few weeks. Um, where we obviously try to get you on a common start, but also get you to connect and work with each other in a way that by the time you're done with this program, you'll be hiring and firing many of your colleagues <laughs> along the way. So, And uh, if you already haven't seen some of our social channels, this is where we are and how we connect, and I hope that uh, you'll all um, join us in one way or the other. We found that uh, Twitter is hit or miss as we get older and older into social media, and most of us are on Facebook, uh, depending on your generation, some of you are on Instagram. I just took a picture for Instagram and I'll post it there. So um, what I'm going to do, what we're going to do today is uh, really just give you a, uh, a good introduction to the program, give you some useful information so you can help you navigate you, connect you to our wonderful people here, and um, just give you a little head start for how things are going. I think especially because we're a graduate program for professionals and professionals who tend to have other things to do beyond just coming to class, this day is really important in terms of just giving you a sense of what it's like to be back in school. Some of you haven't been in school for years. Some of you have just come out of undergrad. Um, but the traditional university experience of actually either living on campus or just eating, breathing, sleeping school is not necessarily the case for some of you or even many of you because you have jobs, families, lives, and you're trying to make all this work. And so we want to help you as much as possible make that work. Um, and first. I'd like to tell you a story because as you probably know our program is at its foundation about storytelling and I want to give you a quick sense of um, the evolution of where we've come in terms of the communication that we celebrate and use and criticize and think about today. I heard some of you actually have read The Circle already which is the, some of the assigned reading which is good. So um, I'm going to talk about me a little more. <laughs> this is me in uh, 1998 in the Judean desert just outside of uh, Jerusalem and Jericho. Um, and I was doing an, uh, a really boring, well, interesting story, but it, at the time Israel was going through one of the most peaceful periods of its history, so there wasn't much to do, and I was a journalist for NBC News. So there's this American archaeologist who's looking for biblical artifacts in the desert. And so I go hang out with him that morning in the desert, and because it's really hot and it's August, um, we had to get there at like 5 in the morning because the sun's still good. For those of you who take pictures or shoot film, you know you have to look for that golden hour. And golden hour is well before 9 o'clock in the morning in the desert because the sun gets really high and really hot. And so I returned to my apartment in Tel Aviv, which is an hour and a half away on the Mediterranean Ocean, later in the morning, and I took a nap because I'd been up so early. And I got a phone call from our assignment desk saying, uh, somebody just blew up two embassies in Africa. We'd like you to figure out a way to get there as soon as possible with the six the evening newscast in New York, um, and it's a race. It's either going to be London or Tel Aviv. You've got to figure out how to do it. Uh, and so it was the beginning, it was a Friday, so it was the beginning of the Jewish Sabbath, which meant there weren't very many flights leaving the, this, the country. And so we had to call a charter company. He said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll take you to Nairobi, we think. Um, we'll, we'll, you can charter a flight for $70,000, and we'll give you a 737 for your team of six. And so um, I... Uh, called NBC, and NBC sometimes, de uh, we call them, NBC stood for nothing but cheap, and we didn't expect them to go for the $70,000 thing, but they did. And so this is the boarding pass. I moved recently, and I actually found the boarding pass. Now, is there anything you unusual, since we're talking about ancient history, is there anything unusual that you see from a distance about this particular boarding pass that you probably wouldn't see today? You could just yell it out. Smoking, yeah, it was a no, it was, you actually had to indicate that it was a no smoking fight, flight. I actually once that year was flying out of, uh, the, um, out of Kosovo and I was on a Russian airliner and it was a smoking plane where you smoke on one side of the aisle, it was smoking, the other side was non-smoking. And as the plane was taxiing down the runway, the cockpit door was open. As the plane was taxiing, the pilots lit up. It was just going to be a great flight, right? Anything else? The fact that it was six people chartering a flight of a 737. Yeah, they assigned a seat, a 19F. 
It's like, what? And somebody asked me that, like, why did you sit in 19F? Well, that was kind of funny because there was business class, but it was old business class at the time with the big armrests, and you couldn't actually. And I thought, you know what? This is a seven hour flight. I'm going to have to work as soon as I arrive. I want to get some sleep. So you go to economy class and you lie down. So um, all the people who don't fly very much ran for business class, and all the people who fly a lot ran for economy. And then the flight attendant comes on and says, by the way, this is like, there's no difference between the two. Just, so it was just kind of funny to see how that happened. So what happened is that as we take off, the pilot gets on the, on the, the intercom and says, we actually, this is such a last minute flight, we have not received permission from the Kenyan authorities to land. And so if we can't land, we're going to uh, have to turn around, and we only have enough fuel to get us to Sudan. We'd have to land in Sudan. And because this is an Israeli air carrier, Sudan does not recognize the Jewish state of Israel. So we're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen. This is typical Israeli approach to everything. It's like, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, so uh, that was very interesting. We weren't too sure what was going to happen. And then as we're about to land, we get a, he gets on again and says, well, apparently the Secretary of State of America, Madeleine Albright at the time, has called the Kenyan government and says, you must let all journalists into the country so they can cover this very important story, which is affecting our citizens. So we got a chance to go. And uh, I was there. We got, on, we got on the air. And this was the scene the next day. This is the picture I took of the building downtown where the U.S. Embassy was. So, it was just a, a, a really devastating story, a really interesting approach to it. And I, and I start with this because this was a world before um, digital, before mobile. And I just want to ask you, as you th think about this unusual story that I just told you, what do you think has changed since then? Would, would, that ha would this kind of story happen again now? Would we go about covering it this way? Would we communicate about it this way? What do you think would be different today? Yeah. We wouldn't be the first ones there, and those images wouldn't be nearly as valuable. Why, why is that? Right, somebody else would have shot it. Now, the question is, would it have been shot by professionals? No. no. It would have been shot by anybody who just happened to be there. Do you think um, Madeleine Albright would have called to let in American journalists? And certainly NBC doesn't have the money now to send some people <laughs> on the plane, <laughs> six people on a 737. So influence, power, access, who actually covers the story has changed. And indicative of where we are today is, we just have to look back a few weeks in terms of what happened uh, for those of you here in the United States, and they've got a lot of international coverage for our international students, in Ferguson, which is just outside of St. Louis, where we had the uh, shooting and the death of a young African-American man by a policeman. And what happened there was um, a story that rose to international attention because of the way that it was handled by the citizenry. Um, and so it was just very interesting to see how that story got traction compared to the stories that we've covered in the past. In fact, there was a blogger who, who looked at, who basically speculated, what, what if, if Ferguson had happened 16 years ago, what would have been different? And he pointed out that, well, Anderson, you know, the, the shooting happens on a Friday. Anderson Cooper it flies in on a Monday from CNN. The police lock down the area so nobody gets any access. And then the story's dead in three days. That's not the case anymore. In fact, if we look at what happened on Twitter, and Twitter was the main carrier of the story for many people, for the hashtag Mike Brown, it just it totally spiked in those three or four days there. And you can see that one particular tweet that I highlighted, we demand that people stay away from us without wearing cameras for our protection. Very much a sign of the times and that we can drive these. And so from a very optimistic point of view, despite the fact this is such a terrible story, from an optimistic point of view, you'd say, well, this is great. Technology is enabling citizenry to have a voice, and it's democratizing production, and it's allowing us access to the things that matter to us. And so we applaud and support these social technologies and the fact that cameras are no longer just in the hands of professionals and for those who can afford $70,000 charter flights to cover stories. Does that sound pretty good to us? Yeah. Another story that happened at the same time, and just happened again yesterday, was the Islamic State, which is in Iraq and Syria, with the beheading of two, now three, um, foreigners or journalists. And the Islamic State, for those of you who've been covering that story, are remarkably good public relations manipulators. They know how to motivate people to join them, they know how to put fear in people, and they know how to actually get foreigners to pay attention to them as well. In the last few years, Americans have been incredibly disinterested in actually doing any kind of intervention militarily in the Middle East, especially with what's going on in Syria. Three days ago, the Wall Street Journal published a poll saying that in the aftermath of the beheading videos of the journalists that were put on Twitter, 
um, there's two thirds of Americans now interested in some kind of military intervention. Just because of that, people have been dying like crazy in this region for the last few years. But the singular killings and atrocious storytelling, frankly, by an entity that understands how to manipulate public opinion using social technology, the same technologies that we applaud, are actually forcing global powers to do something differently. And so there we get a little more nuanced and sort of say, well, now Twitter and Google and everybody else are trying to make sure those videos, the beheadings of those journalists don't show up on those technologies. So access is a two-way street. It's wonderful when we think about democracies and giving voices to citizenry, but it also leaves organizations that we don't necessarily approve of to actually use those same technologies. And we have to think about what that means as well. And so during your time in this program, there will be a lot of celebration of the technology that has enabled so much of this, but we also have to think increasingly critically about where this is going and how we and you as leaders get a chance to frame this a little bit more and say, you know what, hold on a second. We shouldn't necessarily be rushing so quickly through that door because there are deep implications about this. And so I'm just going to give you a short history in digital media that you probably know already just to give you a sense of where we're going and where we come from. So, and the, uh, the, the story I told you for 16 years ago was pre-digital. We digitized, that was the first step in where we are today. In terms of giving us some of the digital tools to capture these stories, this is a picture of me on the USS Abraham Lincoln and, uh, 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 aircraft carrier during the war in 2003 in Iraq in the Persian Gulf. And I'm using a $3,000 camera there. That was a big deal. That all of a sudden, I didn't have to travel with the six people on a 737 to cover a story and spend lots of money to get it. I could go with a backpack and that camera be on an aircraft carrier and cover the war live with a satellite phone in my backpack. And then that's uh, uh, the second in command of Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. I interviewing him with the little camera. And so being able to go very quickly to access those kind of things was very powerful. The second thing that happened was social media that came around. And social media began to hit critical mass when Facebook was introduced in 2004 into universities and then the few years after that. Um, my experience was that, was that as I left NBC News, I started to actually create my own content in films. And you, as you read in the book, if you haven't read my book already, which we gave to you free, is that using social media to basically build community around content was really powerful for me to actually reach people who wouldn't care who the heck I was now that I no longer work for a large global brand like NBC. This was highly sort of liberating to all of a sudden allow individuals to reach the world and not have to have a major brand behind them to have credibility and trust. And so to use that technology and storytelling to make those useful, trustful connections was really powerful. And the third progression is obviously mobile. And this is a uh, screenshot from Zillow, which is a local company that does real estate intelligence and data and is doing very well. Um, and is becoming a mobile first company. They started out on, on, in the web and just in the last few weeks, their mobile traffic has now surpassed their web traffic. And it's because they have great, wonderful, useful, usable apps in mobile. And so this is a wonderful, incredible revolution that's happening before our eyes and it's happening very quickly. There's a futurist who graduated from the University of Washington who consults a lot with Silicon Valley and I saw him speak at a meeting here in Seattle a few months ago whose name is Jeffrey Moore. And he said, one thing we've never done as we try to project the future, no, we, never made, we never made the assumption that everyone would have access to a computer. And all of a sudden, we have to make that assumption. The accessibility of mobile is absolutely accelerating the change that we are trying to get accustomed to. And so Jeffrey Moore has this really interesting timeline in terms of when it comes to technology adoption. You heard Scott talk about that a second ago. And that when we get new technologies, it's usually the early adopters and the visionaries who take it on first because they want to experiment with it. And I count many of you as probably some of those early adopters and visionaries who were willing to take a risk with certain technologies. But at a certain point, there's a make or break. Is it going to hit a larger audience and hit that critical mass, or is it going to recede into the background because it just can't make that jump? And in the case of mobile technology and smartphones specifically, it has made that jump to the point of what we call total assimilation. And this is just huge. So suddenly, when we have that kind of access, that kind of 24-7 connection at all times, the possibilities in terms of what we can do with that connectivity are just massive. And so in the last couple of years, we, we were used to be the Master of Communication and Digital Media program. And last year, we added a second degree. And some of you are, have joined us in that second degree, the Master of Communication in Communities and Networks. And Anita will talk about that in a second. But it's a, it's a recognition that communication, because of this total assimilation, because we are connected to the outside world, the world is at our doorstep 24-7, is that we are in the state of pervasive communication 
in a communication or, uh, age and that we actually have to think about communication first when we're making any kind of strategic decisions because it's not something you leave it till the end for public relations and marketing experts now. It's actually in our bloodstream and we have to think about that. So you have joined the communication leadership program because you're going to be communication leaders if you're not already. And to think about that first and to take a leadership role because communication has become so important. And so what has happened because of this crush of technology in the communication sphere, we have reached a new inflection point, a historical time, and not just for folks in technology, that we can't actually create five-year plans anymore. We can create a two-year plan and revisit it every six months. Things are moving that fast. Forrester, which is a wonderful research company here in the United States of analysts, has basically said that disruption itself is being disrupted. Now that's a weird thing. Like, isn't disruption disrupted already? And essentially, it's, what it is is disruption historically has taken place over decades. So if you think about when the car replaced the horse and buggy, that took about 30 or 40 years. The computer has taken about 20 or 30 years. But now we're talking about years and sometimes months as technology takes its, takes its place and penetrates our society. And the challenge that we have, and this is one of the reasons why I ask you to read The Circle, is that as a society, we are not moving fast enough to keep up with that technology, both from a social point of view, from a cultural point of view, and from a legal point of view. And this is why there's so much anxiety right now. We just can't keep up with the speed, but it's happening. And so we've got to think about that, and as communication leaders, you've got to lead the way in terms of how these communication technologies get used. It also means that even things that we took for granted, like the web, we think the web will never change, you know? And actually, it's getting disrupted that advertising isn't working, that we have a six second attention span on any website, that we're now stuck to our mobile phone more than to our computer, and suddenly the engagement on the web isn't working the way it used to. And so one of the ways that we like to do this is we like to experiment. We are not an academic program. We do have rigorous academic standards, but we believe in totally being practitioners of this and trying it out as it comes. And so I just have a screenshot here. Um, our program actually has a television show, and it's called Four Peaks. And we we've experimented with this notion of branded content, that maybe there's a new way of engaging people by getting our point across and our brand across at the same time. And last year, we produced a show in collaboration with the Museum of History and Industry here in Seattle that wanted to create an innovation exhibit. And so they came to us and said, can you produce the video for it? Thought, sure, we can produce the video for it, but can we put some of that video on our television show as well? Because the video included interviews with some of the most influential people in this region who don't normally go on television. And so suddenly, we had interviews with Jeff Bezos. We're back at the Museum of History and Industry, home to the new Bezos Center for Innovation. Let's return to my conversation with Jeff Bezos. Is there a particular recipe that you have in terms of how you actually innovate in that collaborative uh, culture? I think, um, and I, don't, I don't think there's a particular recipe, but there are elements of what we do uh, that I think help. So one of them is that inside our culture, we understand that even though we have some big businesses, new businesses start out small. And so, you know, it, we, we, it, it would be very easy for, say, the person who runs uh, our U.S. books. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that because I was so inspired by Jeff Bezos that I got a Jeff Bezos haircut. So... <laughs> <laughs> um. There's other reasons for that. I'll tell you about that in class. But, <laughs> but that's the kind of access. I mean, we are using our brand to connect to somebody else's brand to get access to people who are normally wouldn't give a darn about this graduate program and actually include them in our network. So the next time I see Jeff Bezos or somebody else from Amazon, they're going to say, oh, that's the guy that runs that graduate program. That's pretty cool, right? We're this wonderful, you know, innovative program that's sort of breaking rules along the way, and we get access to people like that because of the content that we create, and that's a great thing. So part of this inflection point, this time of change, also, as we move into it, is really about the Internet of Things, about connected devices, that even beyond the cell phone and the computer, the physical inanimate objects in our everyday lives are waking up, and they're connecting to companies, they're connecting to us, they're gathering data about us, some of that data is useful, some of it's not. Baidu, the Chinese Internet giant, a few weeks ago announced a prototype, smart chopsticks. And apparently, it will read the oil content of your food as you pick it up and see if it give you information about that. And that has some huge implications. You know, traditionally, when we try to use communication to persuade people to think differently or do something differently, it has been very media-centric. 
you know, use a newspaper article or an advertisement or something on television or a movie to make us think differently about something. Now suddenly we have access to real-time data from these things that we're using, from our chopsticks and our refrigerators and our sneakers and our toothbrushes that are telling us, you know, if you actually do this differently, this will happen. And that's changing our minds. And so the question that we're going to have to explore here is whether storytelling really is or media is only the, the only way to influence behavior change. And what is data? Is data a form of storytelling or not? Just something to think about. So because we're in a constantly iterative process in this program, my colleagues and I sat down at a retreat last week just to think about, you know, who are we? We're always thinking about who are we? We're always changing and updating our curriculum because there are no textbooks for a lot of the stuff that we teach in this program. And so one of the assignments we had was to think about how we actually explain what this program is. And so um, this weekend I put together a draft and we're still honing it and we'll probably share it with you and get your input as well. But the idea of some of the things I just told you about is that this program is about you know, because we're in this pervasive state of communication, this 24-7 world where there's mobile and digital and the Internet of Things, we actually have to think very differently about how we connect to people and inspire them to get with our program and to make some kind of change. And, and very much that includes creativity. And creativity is a very hard thing for professionals to engage with. Professionals think about performance and about following certain guidelines that institutions have set up, but creativity does not work very well generally in a professional setting. But in this new world, it has to. And this is the reason why, after you take the class with me, in the winter, the class with Anita, Anita's class is focused almost entirely on being a creative leader. This is a fundamental competence in the 21st century. And as we can talk to industry leaders about what they're looking for and people they hire, they're saying, you know what, communication, collaboration, creativity, those are the three things. Very soft skills. Yeah, we probably want people who can code and do data analysis and all that stuff. But those three things that really bring an aptitude to what we need and an attitude are crucial. And that's why, that's why we focused on that. And essentially, how do you build community? Community is actually further than an audience. That has been the traditional question. What's my message and what's my audience in communication? Now, now it's more like, what's my narrative? How do I inspire people? And how do I create community? And community requires more accountability, sustained connection, and a relationship when nobody has attention anymore. And so how do you do that? It's gotten much harder. We've got more tools, but there's more people talking at the same time. And so, in my class, we will practice this thing called communication first, and, we'll, and don't worry about taking these, any of these notes, but this is some of the methodology that we're going to explore, and we're actually going to have two real-world clients that have come to us, to our program, for help. So we're going to be working with those two real-world clients in my class to apply this methodology to help them think about how they should be communicating in this new world. And at the end of the class, in the final session, you'll be presenting to these clients you'll have actually proposals that you're going to want to actually work on. And you'll get to actually to get to work with them directly and connect to them and ask them questions. So this stuff is real. It's happening very fast. The way that we would have done this even two years ago is different, and you get a chance to practice it. I want to show you, because I've been talking a bit about the Internet of Things, I want to show you um, some technology that's coming out right now that is, being, that is all the rage and that's being applied in, 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 in stores and stadiums now in the United States, and it's called um, Beacons. This is a, originally a, an Apple technology, but it, it actually gets us beyond the traditional social media thinking that we've had. And so we're thinking now about time and place and where we are with our mobile device. Let me just show you this two-minute video just to give you a sense. And this is not science fiction. This stuff is real. It's here now. As you walk, your eyes process terabytes of information about the world around you. Your subconscious is constantly scanning for recognizable objects and locations to give you context and help you navigate. But if you close your eyes for a moment, you can only walk a few steps before your brain loses its context and forces you to stop. That's the world your smartphone lives in every day. It's a powerful computer, but it's completely blind. Last year, we introduced Estimote Beacons to solve just that. They're small sensors that can be placed anywhere to provide context and micro-location to any smart device. Now, we're introducing Estimote Stickers, tiny beacons with built-in accelerometers and temperature sensors. You can stick them to any of your favorite objects nearby. We call them nearables. Using stickers in our rich SDK, you can build a new generation of amazing context-aware apps. For example, if you stick one to your bike, your phone can automatically track your routes, record where you left it, and even detect motion if someone moves it. Or how about an app that can turn on an alarm clock only when you need it? 
You have a 9 a.m. meeting on your calendar, and thanks to the sticker, your phone knows that your context is still the bedroom. And since traffic is backed up, it wakes you up a few minutes early. What about when a customer picks up something they're interested in? Because the sticker can sense motion, they can be presented with relevant information about the color options, similar products, or specials. Then, at the end of the day, a store owner can see what products customers are interacting with most and use that info to fine-tune promotions and sales or make adjustments to the store layout. The potential applications are endless, even something as simple as an app that lets you know when you forget your bag when you leave a coffee shop. Join thousands of developers worldwide and build your own apps for nearables. Order your sticker development kit today. Estimote. Reality matters. So some people are calling this the age of context or um, ambient computing in that our devices are no longer waiting for us to interact with it to actually give us what we need. It's actually predicting what we're going to need uh, even before we think about it. For those of you who are on Android, if you have Google Now, it, it, if it knows where you live and where you work and where you are, it will actually tell you that it's time to leave for a meeting even before you think about it and even tell you how to get there before you think about it. So this is how this is moving. Brent Friedman, who's co-teaching our class together, actually uh, has got a startup that focuses entirely on this notion of owning the moment, time and place, using these technologies, and he'll tell us more about that in class. And so what we want to recognize is that it's no longer enough. We're actually now in the middle ages of these technologies. It's no longer, or middle innings if you're a baseball fan. It's no longer enough to say, oh, we're an organization, we're on Facebook and Twitter and we have a YouTube channel, we're great, we're cool, we're, we're, we're okay in this age. The answer is no. This stuff is still moving so fast that you may not be engaging entirely proper, appropriately with the communities you're trying to reach. And so this is some recent statistics in terms of social media. Facebook, of course, is the champion in terms of the kind of engagement. I think people spend about 13 to 18 minutes a day on Facebook, which is amazing for a website. But look, Twitter, we think Twitter is important, but look at Instagram and Snapchat, which are two mobile-first social media platforms, have both, are both more important than Twitter. And millennials and younger people, especially, and some of you are among that generation, I've spoken to a number of organizations where they are not on Facebook, and they want to use these more text-based um, social platforms because they think that's going to get them um, more direct interaction with the people that matter to them and they're very wary about how they're being seen in public on these social channels. And so these are things to think about as you're considering how you reach people and how you do it. And if, you're, if people are more using these social channels, it's actually harder to recognize how to measure them and to find their influence because they're not using the web-based ones. And some people are beginning to call this dark social because it's actually dark to us. Anybody participate in an ice bucket challenge over the last few weeks. It's a remarkable campaign. You're looking at a foundation and a research organization that got 32 times more um, interaction and engagement than they normally do at this time of year because of this. And if you haven't seen any of these videos, I encourage you to. You know, very important people and not so important people did this. And we're able to raise engagement through video, through storytelling, through social media in a way that we haven't seen. And so there's some best practices here, and other people have sort of taken advantage of this kind of attention. But it's just very interesting to see how that has worked out. But we also have to recognize um, that as we commit our lives further to these companies, and they are companies, they don't necessarily have our best interests at heart, that they're not necessarily doing what we hoped that they would do. A few years ago when we looked at social media, we hoped that they would break down the walls with the communities and allow us to see the other side. This is a really interesting infographic during the height of the Gaza conflict a few weeks ago where the hashtags for those who supported the Palestinians and the hashtags for those who supported the Israelis, and you can see that never the twain shall meet. And what's happening here is that we're not seeing or we're not, you know, basically it's the social media is enabling us to actually meet like-minded people and not cross the chasm or the bridge to see the others. Because as these companies become more and more uh, in sort of tied with Wall Street because they've gone public, they have the proof they're going to make money. And so the content that gets thrown into our feeds has to drive us to the advertising. And so they want to give us stuff they think is relevant to us. And the last thing they want to do is piss us off and give us somebody else's opinion that we don't agree with. And so even as these social technologies become really important for how we see the world, we may be getting a very limited view of that world. This is an, a headline from about a week ago looking at Twitter that Twitter is now putting stuff in our feed that we never signed up to see. And that algorithms are actually creating these really interesting filters. And there's some real challenges with this. For those of you who were covering or looking at the Ferguson story last month, 
people would notice that they were seeing a lot about Ferguson on Twitter and nothing in Facebook about it. They were driving engagement in Facebook differently. And so as we leave journalism behind and we don't look at newspapers that go to websites anymore that have pure news, we rely on these social feeds to get a view of the world, we've got to be careful because that view of the world may be really skewed. And it may be entirely based on what a company thinks we want to see and it's not giving us what we think we should see. General Electric, a large industrial conglomerate, now considers itself a media company. So this is part of this communications first world that, would, that even these guys who work in a very industrial environment think that they should be connected and telling stories all the time, which is wonderful. However, as you go through this program and think about what we're doing, there's a fine line between storytelling, which is really important to an authentic connection to people, representation of organization, but if we do, we do too much storytelling, we don't necessarily reach the objectives of organization to actually have return on investment. But if we do too much selling and not enough storytelling, then people think that uh, we're, we're just hucksters. All right, well, I'm really personally excited to have you here. Um, every year is special, and I know we're going to do some great work together. And you're coming during a very special time, uh, both at the program and where the subject matter is going. So I'm really looking forward to working with all of you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm not used to that kind of applause. <laughs>